Good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to our Syngenta Blackgrass and application webinar. Um, I'd just like to make a few introductions before we start. Uh, my name is Sally Green, and I am the Marketing Communications Lead here at Syngenta. And I'd like to introduce you to Georgina Wood. Uh, she is our Field Technical Manager and Grassweed Specialist, and she'll be taking you through our Blackgrass section of this meeting. Uh, and also, I'd like to introduce you to Harry Fordham. Uh, he's our new farming technology lead and we'll be taking you through the application section as well. Uh, just a couple of points on housekeeping before we start. Um, we are recording this webinar, which is why you can only see us as speakers and not each other. And also, um, if you would like to submit questions, you should be able to do that in the Q&A function at the very bottom um, of the Zoom screen. Um, so please submit questions as you think of them. Um, they will come through to all of us and we can take those at the end for you. Um, so again, thank you for joining and I'd like to hand you over to Georgie. Thanks, Sally. Um, so we will kick off. Um, um, I think just the final thing to add on the housekeeping is that bases and the Roso points will be sent in an email following the meeting. Um, so you'll get that at the end. So what are we actually going to cover um, in, in this short webinar? First of all, we'll give a bit of an update from our Barton Innovation Centre. Then we'll have a look at timing for residual herbicide applications, where DeFi fits alongside the new chemistry that's in the market this year. Have a quick look at our cultivation insight tool, um, and then I'll hand over to Harry to look at application advice um, for the season ahead. So if we begin um, with our Barton Innovation Centre, um, I'm sure many of you will have been along to that or will have heard about it in previous webinars before. But this is a five year project that we've been running um, in Barton in Cambridgeshire, um, and we're currently in the fifth year of that this year. So the picture that you see on the left hand of the screen there um, is of summer 2016, um, before the project started with really high black rust levels of 656 heads per metre squared. And then the second picture you can see is the establishment um, in this season's crop. Now, the way that the trial is laid out, um, it's across quite a large field um, and it's been divided up. We have both a cropping matrix and a cultivation matrix in that field. Um, and you can see how that's been latticed over first year, the second year, third year. Um, and the fourth and fifth years um, have been somewhat disrupted by the um, fairly terrible autumn weather that we've had. So we have been forced into a spring drilling situation in the last two seasons, um, which has had implications both for the, that cropping matrix, but also for the cultivation matrix um, by following with, with spring crops. So every year we've set out with the intention of autumn drilling. So our cultivations have been done um, in September, um, but then for the past two seasons, we have been forced into a spring drilling situation. So have been drilling spring wheat instead of winter wheat. Now, if we get into the data really quickly, um, I just wanted to show some of the impacts of last season. So this is the data that we took from um, 2020 um, summer. Um, and in there, you can see that that, that spring um, situation we were in, um, the ploughing has been a real benefit in terms of the black grass control. Um, so all of those boxes, basically it's conditionally formatted. So low levels of black grass in heads per meter squared are green, high levels are the red boxes that you can see. So clearly we've had a really big benefit from the plough because ultimately we've given ourselves um, a situation where we've ploughed down any seed that was returned in the previous season and then had a really good stale seed bed approach. So then going into this season, um, you can see the data from, from this year. Um, so these counts were taken just a couple of weeks ago. Um, the matrix now has 126 unique um, cultivation programmes within it. Um, so lots and lots of data coming through in there. Again, what you can see is um, the benefit of the plough from last year, those boxes still remain relatively green. Um, and then the plough, again, 
when we're going across the screen, we see is, is predominantly green too. Um, and, and this is a, a bit of a double um, or, or an amplified response because where we ploughed this year, um, we also saw much better crop establishment. So we, we buried any seed that was there. We created a really good seed bed and that's really helped with the establishment of that spring crop. You remember um, that spring this year was somewhat challenging in, in that we had um, very wet autumn. Then once it dried out, it stayed dry for a while, um, but was relatively cool at that time, um, followed by rain, which came in May. Um, but that, that plough seedbed um, has, has been the best in terms of crop establishment this year, for sure. And resulting, we've also seen low black grass numbers. If we have a look at some of the detail, um, the, the highlighted red box there is actually where we saw the worst levels of black grass um, in last year's crop. So that's the direct drill, min till, min till, direct drill plot. Um, and you can see in the bottom chart how we've divided that up this year into min till, direct drill and plough. And it's really clear in this situation that you can see the plough has had a really huge benefit um, in terms of reducing that black grass um, to, to a much more manageable number of 22 heads per metre squared. If we then pull out a couple of the other plots, kind of last year where we had complete com control of black grass and how we've then divided those plots up again this year in, into those same cultivations. Um, again, I think you can see um, that the plough has been, has been quite good, but these numbers have all gone up versus last year, um, which clearly we've, we've brought some seed to the surface. Um, you might expect that the direct drilling there would be the best because we haven't moved the soil at all and, and in theory have not returned any seed from the previous year. Um, however, a combination of seed being on the surface um, or in the germination zone from previous seasons and relatively poor crop establishment that we saw because of the challenging spring conditions, um, those direct drill plots were much thinner and the crop much less competitive um, than, than where we had ploughed and created a much better seedbed. In terms of the min till there, you can see quite a range in, in the number of, of grass weeds that we've got coming through that min till. And that's because we've stirred up um, that, that top 15 centimetres um, with a non-inversion cultivation. Um, and, and in some situations, um, that's led to us bringing quite a lot of seed into that germination zone. If we just draw out the averages um, from this year, you can see that ploughing, um, in terms of percent control versus the untreated or the worst plot that we have. We don't have any untreated in this situation, so it's versus the worst plot. Um, we've got over 95% control coming from that plough, um, which is really good, um, with min till and direct drilling um, being more like 60%. If we take a look at our best and worst plots, um, so this is all of the five years kind of adding together up into this season um, and what we see now in the field at this time. Um, our continuous plough plot, we have just two black grass heads per metre squared. So versus the 656 that we started with um, before the project began, um, that's a really good place to have got to. In contrast to that, in, in the worst plot, um, which is our continuous direct drilling, um, where we've had no cultivation at all, no soil movement throughout those five years. Um, you can see that we've got really high numbers still up at, at almost 500 heads per metre squared there. And if we think about why that is, we're, we're purely looking at movement of seed um, in the soil profile, but also the crop establishment has a big impact as we've seen as well. Um, but if we look at the um, seed bank that we're dealing with. In the best plot from, from this year, um, I've modelled this using our Cultivation Insight tool, which is on the website, and you can go through and look at how different cultivations impact on the seed bed, um, on the seed bank, sorry. Um, and you can see our best control. Um, the seeds that we have in that germination zone 
um, are from year two and year four. Um, and, and so by understanding how many seeds you've returned in each year and what the dormancy and viability of those seeds is likely to be, you can get a good gauge as to, to what kind of population you will potentially be dealing with in, in the coming cropping year. You can see in the worst plot where we've been continually direct drilling, we're just overlaying that seed into the germination zone year on year. So building up a really, really high number in that germination zone and just allowing them to come through every year. So um, I think that's quite an interesting tool to help visualize where the seed lies within the seed bank. And if we think about why the position of the seed in the seed bank matters, um, you can see from the chart here that seed which is lower down in the profile um, takes longer to emerge. So as that seedling develops, seed which is kind of in the middle of that non-inversion tillage zone, so around 10 centimetres, is taking 17 days um, to emerge. Um, much less of it is emerging, but it's taking much longer. And if we think about what the impact of that is, um, that kind of determines the, the duration of the flush of black grass that we get, or is one of the factors that does that anyway. So if we have lots of seed lower down in this profile, we can expect to see that flush of black grass coming over a much longer period of time. And there's implications of that in terms of deciding what to do in terms of herbicide strategy, um, Obviously, direct drilling, uh, sorry, delayed drilling um, is a really important part of, of grass weed management. And this is one of the reasons why the more you can delay, the more seed you get that's coming from depth and, and you can then um, spray that off before drilling the crop. Um, but also, once you, once you are drilling, um, understanding how to approach your residual herbicide strategy in order to get the best control um, is something that this can help to inform. Another factor which affects um, the duration of that black grass flush is dormancy of the freshly shed seed. Um, we've tested the dormancy of the seed um, at Barton each year, and we have had seasons where it's varied greatly. So we know that if we have a warm and dry period during the time that black grass is setting seed, that will then have potentially low dormancy in the following season. Whereas if we have cool and wet conditions, maybe like this year, for instance, we're much more likely to have high dormancy black grass seed. And that's something that we need to think about going into the autumn. So some of our trials have shown the benefit of a sequenced approach where we have a high, high dormancy situation. So in each case, we have seen a benefit from that sequence because it's additional chemistry that we've applied, but that um, sequenced approach has had a much bigger impact, so 27% versus 22% in a high dormancy year versus a low dormancy year. Um, so that's an extra 5%. Um, so the benefit of the sequence is greater where we have a longer duration of the flush of black grass coming through. And so I just wanted to comment on um, the cultivations that we've done at, um, at Barton, and they are much like these, um, which we've done in our cultivation agriculture project too. So in the cultivation ag project, we're looking at many factors, um, not just grass weed control, which is what we've really focused on at Barton. And clearly on farm, grass weed control is just one part of what, what you're thinking about. Um, and it's perhaps not the biggest driving factor, although it will be one. Um, but we're aware that there are many other factors which are affecting your decisions when it comes to cultivation. So um, I just wanted to comment on the fact that although our data from the, the five years has shown the continuous plough to give the best result in terms of black grass management um, and continuous direct drilling to give the worst result in terms of black grass management. Um, there's many other factors that you'll be thinking about outside of um, grass weed control as, as a solo factor. So the conservation agriculture project is it's something that's run um, by my colleagues. Um, and it's again a long-term project where we've got two different sites and we've been looking at 
um, different cultivation strategies that you can see on the screen now and doing lots and lots of measurements to understand the impact of those. Um, so we just have a quick look at some of the summary data from that. We have Lenham, which is a light land site in Kent, and Loddington, um, which is the heavy land site. Um, and just to give you a kind of a brief view of the data that we've seen um, over two years at Lenham and three years at Loddington, this data is, is showing um, the, the benefits and pitfalls of the conventional, um, sorry, the sustainable system, the direct drill system versus the conventional system. So the couple of things I wanted to pull out was that clearly um, you can see that there is a drop in terms of crop establishment and yield, um, particularly so on the heavy land site. And, and this backs up what we've seen at Barton as well, in that where we've been direct drilling, we have seen more challenging um, crop establishment conditions. Um, and in many cases, um, that has had an impact on yield as well. However, as a farm business, um, probably one of the factors that you're, you're very interested in is the net profit that we see over, over at this side. Um, and you can see that on, on both sites, um, the sustainable system too, the direct drilling, um, has actually delivered an increase in net profit. Another of the driving factors I think that um, we'll start to focus on more as we go into the future um, is carbon footprint. And again, you can see that there are benefits from that direct drilling approach in terms of reducing carbon footprint too. So although the results I've presented from the Barton site show a significant benefit from the plow um, and that continuous plowing has given us in that one site um, the best result in terms of black grass management, there is a lot more to think about um, than just grass weed control, and we do recognise that um, as well. So if we just move on and quickly think about application timings um, and the approach for residual herbicides. Um, this is the weather data for the autumn just gone, um, with the blue bars being rainfall and then wind speeds being represented with, with the lines and the dots. Um, you can see that it was a, a really challenging autumn and that's why we were forced into a spring drilling situation. I looked back at the, um, at the last autumn where we were able to drill in the autumn. And again, you can see, you know, there's, there's fairly consistent rainfall um, over many, many days. Um, and also wind speeds um, are quite high at that time of year as well. So the autumn weather is, is always unpredictable um, and it is a real challenge in terms of A, drilling, but also in terms of timing and herbicide applications as well. So before we pass on um, to Harry to kind of give a bit of the detail about application, I just wanted to talk quickly about timing um, and the different timings that we kind of talk about when suggesting herbicide programs um, and what, what they really mean. So we have pre-emergence, um, which is before um, the seedling reaches the surface. Um, and with a lot of herbicides having their selectivity, um, so that's their effect on the weed and not the crop, being based on the crop's ability to avoid the, um, the chemistry um, because they're protected by that barrier of soil above. Um, that pre-emergence timing um, is green in terms of um, crop safety. At the peri-emergence timing, um, that first leaf is just emerging through the soil. Um, and this is a really challenging time in terms of crop safety of residual herbicides because any impact on that initial emerging leaf has the potential to take that plant out completely. Um, so in terms of crop safety risk, um, this peri-emergence timing is, is the most challenging. Um, and if applying at this time, choosing kind of safer um, actives would be the way to go or reducing rates. As we move into post-emergence, um, the, the crop safety risk becomes less because any impact that you have on that plant is likely to, it may perhaps take out a leaf or two, um, but it's unlike, unlikely to take the plant out completely. Um, so, so that risk is reduced as the crop comes through further. 
And this is what we think of in terms of peri-emergence, so just that very initial stage at, as the crop is coming through the ground, which you see is kind of a green haze across the surface. Um, that is the most risky in terms of crop safety. When we think about efficacy of our products, both pre- and peri-emergence, we do get very good efficacy. And that's because the part of the plant which is taking up the chemical um, it, it's close to the surface um, and we can have a good effect. As we move later, um, we have more of the grass weeds through the surface um, and we're, we're less likely to achieve good control, particularly at that late post-emergence timing, um, because, because we've missed the time when, when the um, merry stems of the plant are close to the surface and able to take up enough of that chemical to have a lethal effect on the weed. So to summarise that, we've just got a little chart here which shows that timing really is a, is a balance. If we target the pre-M timing, we have the best option in terms of both safety um, and efficacy. Um, and when we get to peri and post-M, it's more of a balance. So we need to think more about our choice and rates of herbicide that we apply. We've got lots of data um, over several years that shows that increasing the number of active ingredients in the mix um, is the way to achieve the best levels of control. And this is another reason why that pre-emergence timing is, is where we believe that we should be targeting, um, because that's when it's safest to use these larger stacks of chemistry. And in terms of looking at DeFi, um, we've done some trials this year which have looked at the addition of DeFi to some of the newer chemistry that's on the market. And we've consistently seen um, across these three trials that DeFi is adding to those mixtures. These are all applied in a pre-emergent situation. Um, and you can see that the new um, Metribuzin brands, Alternator Met and Octavian Met, um, are applied at the 0.5 rate because the applications are beyond the end of September, um, as most um, grass weed situations will be drilling beyond the end of September. Um, that is one of the restrictions that's on those labels. So um, it's just the half rate that we've used in these trials. And you can see the addition of DeFi is adding around 10% to those new Metribucin products. If we then look at Procluse, which is the Aclonofem brand, um, we see again DeFi is still adding around 8% in terms of control. Um, to that and, and edging us towards 90% control, um, which in combination with cultural control methods will hopefully get us towards that 97% control that we're aiming for overall. So that's all from me in terms of a very quick run through of um, the Barton site timings and some product choice options for um, residual herbicides for this year. And I will just hand over to Harry to run through application. Cheers, Georgie. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Harry Fordham, uh, New Farming Technologies Lead for the UK Benelux and Nordics. Uh, so I do a lot of the application work uh, that uh, Georgie is referring to, uh, and we, uh, we get the chance to also look at other digital tools as well. But today, mainly focusing on, uh, well, for obvious reasons, black grass application, uh, and that is generally uh, focused around our site at uh, Barton in Cambridgeshire, but we also have uh, multiple sites across Northern Europe within which a lot of our application trials are taking place. So I'll, I'll talk about some specifics, but also talk about some of the general information that we've, uh, we've gleaned from our trial work over the last four, five, six years. So if we go to the next slide, please, Georgie. So first of all, we'll talk about water volume. Now, um, we've been talking about water volume at Syngenta, um, well, for, for a long, long time. Uh, and over the last four or five years, the focus has been uh, discussing whether we should increase our water volumes from 100 litres a hectare uh, up to 200. And you'll see here, in uh, to put it to an example, to put it into context, and uh, the top, top example is, is the equivalent of 100 litres a hectare and that's essentially only about two teaspoons of, of spray solution across every metre squared. So you're talking about 
um, a very small quantity of, of, of formulation that we're trying to spread over quite a quite an area there and and uh, and it's like when I talk about weather uh, and the equivalent of rain 100 litres a hectare remember is the equivalent of 0 0.01 uh, millimetres of rain so we're talking about very small quantities of water and below that obviously we have 200 litres a hectare and that it sounds obvious but it delivers double the amount of water volume and double the amount of droplets that's the equivalent of four teaspoons of liquid in a meter squared and the reason we we reiterate this point is because when we're talking about preems, we're trying to get even coverage and even distribution of that coverage. And a very good way to do that is increasing water volume. Yes, you slightly decrease the concentration of, of active per droplet, but you have double the amount of droplets. So you get even distribution and coverage across the soil. Just on to the next slide, please, Georgie. And this is some really cool stuff that we did and it really reiterates the fact of the 200 litres a hectare message and it shows quite clearly why 200 litres a hectare works really nicely and, and why we get the benefits that we get from using it. And uh, in this trial we collaborated with uh, Hummingbird, uh, the drone technology company, to look at uh, a, a recovery agent mixed in with our, our spray formulation. And this is a dye that we can spray onto the soil that is then picked up by a drone and it can pick out different colors of, dro of dye sorry, across the soil. So if you click through the first two, please, Georgie, we have here the first two sites um, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And the dye is picked up in it as a green color um, on, our, on our map below. Uh, and the more reddy orangey color is, is just, just plain soil. And what you can see here is on the left hand side, there is some dye that has been applied, but on the right hand side, obviously a lot more and, and quite a nice even distribution of the coverage of dye across the whole length and width of our plot. And if we take away the other blue boxes, you can see as we go down, we still have uneven levels of coverage in the middle two, but on the bottom ones down there, you can see nice green uh, clear um, uh, applications across the width and the length of the plot. And this is to illustrate quite nicely what, what the effect water volume can have in terms of distribution and coverage of products across, across the soil surface. And if we reveal uh, the next bit, you can see that on the top two, for example, that is a 3D nozzle at 100 litres a hectare compared to the brand new 3D90 at 200 litres a hectare. And it might sound obvious, but because we're putting more water down, we're getting more deposition of the dye and also in this context, the, the product. And that gives us a greater level of efficacy. And our trials over the last five or six years uh, across Northern Europe back up this data. And you can see if we go down a level to the TTI and the X-ray nozzle, we're at 100 litres a hectare. There is much less dye, much more, much less visibility of, uh, of deposition and coverage. And then the bottom two, likewise, both at 200 litres a hectare uh, and both giving good levels of deposition and coverage uh, and a marked improvement of those that are over 100 litres. And that's why we still recommend 200 litres a hectare, sort of regardless of what nozzle you use, that is uh, a, one of the impacts that can have the biggest effect on your efficacy of product. Which move on to the next slide. And this here, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is a box on whisker diagram, and it shows you data over 400 different trial sites over the last five years across all of Northern Europe. And this is looking at grass weed control uh, in terms of water volume. Uh, and you see we have different colors, so blue, green, red, and yellow. Uh, the blue box and whisker is at 50 liters a hectare, green is 100, red is 200, and yellow is 400. Um, just to explain what a box and whisker diagram is, and sorry if I'm teaching you to suck eggs, but um, hopefully it'll help illustrate the point. Uh, the, the two smaller lines that protrude from the fat rectangle, they are the range of results. So for 50 litres a hectare, the range, for example, goes from 0% control up to 95% control. The fat rectangle in the middle, that starts at the uh, 25th percentile and moves up to the 75th percentile um, data point. And then the, uh, the dotted line in the middle is the average and the solid line is the median. So the, the line to focus on is the dotted line because that's the average control across all the data points. But what's important to remember the, in this is the range is, is equally as important because that's like thinking of it in terms of gambling. So if the range is from naught to 95, like we have a 50 liters a hectare, I like to think of that as the sort of the 20 to one outsider uh, coming, in off, coming in from the back rail. 
the green, uh, 100 liters a hectare. We're not, we're looking there. You see the average control is just under 80%. The range is between 40 to 100%. So yeah, you might get a really good result in some circumstances, but likewise, you may only get 40% control, but the average is under 80. Um, so that's not brilliant. When we go to the two and 400 liters a hectare, the red and the yellow, we've got a range of about 70 to 100% control, but the average for the 200 liters a hectare is just under 90 and for 400 is, is just over 85. So we're getting really good consistent levels of good control at those higher water volumes. And that's why we still recommend 200 liters a hectare. Um, and you can see uh, we've got at the bottom there, the data points, there's over 400 data points in this, um, in this, uh, in this water volume trial. And this is, you know, in various circumstances in various locations. So that's why we're still confident in 200 liters a hectare and we'll continue to, to uh, uh, suggest that as a good water volume to use. Which go on to the next one, please. So just to remind you, we've got low slow covered is our, our application campaign. And um, it's to illustrate uh, all the different points. And I, I won't go into it in too much detail, but we've got obviously boom height as a recommendation, uh, forward speed as a recommendation. Uh, and we and I'll come on to nozzle choice. I've talked about water volume, but just to reiterate the point that ensuring your boom height is correct at 50 centimeters and your forward speed is less than 12 kilometers an hour. Is, um, is really important when it comes to maximizing efficacy from our products. And then on the right hand side there you'll see um, Spray Assist, just to, just to remind you of our, our app that gives you advice on the best way to apply products. Uh, it's essentially a, a nozzle recommendation app. So it's, it's like having uh, one of our, our application specialists in your pocket. Uh, if that's a good thing or not, it's up to you, but it will give you uh, advice on uh, the right nozzle to use in the right time in the job you're trying to do in the location you're in with the weather conditions you are facing. If we just move on to the next one, please. And what's really important about um, our, our pre-emergence application timings and, cover and uh, uh, maximizing efficacy is uh, we often talk about coverage when it comes to uh, application, but actually talking about distribution of that coverage is just as important. And here we have two cakes that Georgie kindly baked for us. Um, on the left-hand side, we have 50% coverage, and on the right-hand side, we have 50% coverage. But as we, I'm sure you'll all appreciate, if you got a slice of the one on the left, you'd be an unhappy camper. If you got a slice of the one on the right, you would be much happier because you, the icing is much more evenly distributed despite the fact the coverage is even across both. So we need to just remember that even distribution of coverage is highly important. And that's when if we're thinking about 90% drift reduction nozzles with the bigger droplet sizes that are less likely to drift, we get even distribution of good levels of coverage. And that's where the benefits of these 90% drift, drift reduction nozzles come in. If we just move on to the next one, please. So to start with, just to introduce you all to the 3D90 nozzle, this is a brand new Syngenta nozzle that's been developed uh, in conjunction with me, my colleagues, uh, Hypro Pentair, our specialist at Jealous Hill. 3D90 is a, a brand new uh, piece of technology that is um, uh, the next step in our 3D family. Uh, it uh, is going through currently the process of drift reduction legislation, and we are anticipating it to gain four star LIRAP rating. And we hope we are anticipating it will get four star at um, three bar, and then we'll get um, three star at five bar pressure. So it gives you great flexibility and confidence that the drift reduction um, capability will be there at various water volumes uh, and pressures and forward speeds. It has an integrated cap um, and a 55 degree angle, but I'll come on to a little bit about that later on. If we just move on to the next slide. Just to reiterate the importance of how of application and why we do talk about nozzles and why Syngenta develop nozzles to uh, maximize the efficacy of products. We believe that only 50% of the control comes from the product itself. The other 50% is you guys doing the job. And that might be mechanical, so ensuring the sprayer is set up correctly. It might be things like ensuring the timing and the weather's correct. And as Georgie, sh Georgie showed earlier, um, the, the difference between pre-emergence, peri and post-emergence in terms of efficacy is massive as well as crop safety. And that's why we know timing is important. But then finally, fine tuning. And this is where I like to think of as nozzle selection, ensuring things like boom is calibrated correctly. If you have auto shut off and that cal is calibrated correctly, uh, for example. So what impact can nozzles have if we just move on? 
The, the, the Syngenta nozzle legacy, as we know, has been ongoing. And for those of you who, who aren't that au fait with Syngenta nozzles, we've been um, uh, starting this journey about 15 or 20 years ago with the Hawk nozzle. Uh, we then moved on to the Defy nozzle, the white Defy nozzle there in the middle, um, and then the 3D, and now onto the 3D90. And as you'll see, as, as we've gone along, um, drift reduction has become greater. As we know, it's, it's, it's um, much more relevant to what we're doing in today's day and age under regulatory pressure, um, and also ensuring that uh, we are doing the job the best we can, both safely and efficiently. But what we're trying to do with all of these nozzles is not compromise between drift reduction and efficacy. And with the 3D90, we believe we have got onto a real purple patch of a nozzle that has a nice angle, a nice level of drift reduction that does not compromise in pre-emergence herbicide application. If we just move on to the next one. So what are the key parts of the 3D90 nozzle? We have a pre-orifice at the top, now this is key because this means it's not an air induction nozzle. The drift reduction capability comes from pre-orifice. Now this means it is, cold, um, it is compatible with pulse width modulation technology because it is not air induction. Um, so it is future proof. It can be used on a standard sprayer and a pulse width modulation sprayer. There's the body that produces the inline, incline. Now this is a 55 degree angle. The reason we have chosen this angle is because it maximizes deposition on both front and rear of the targets. And one of the things that we all struggle with when applying these products uh, with nozzles is ensuring that we get maximum deposition on the rear of targets. And when we've done work in track sprayer at Jellets Hill, um, the way to do that is, at, is to uh, get the angle at 55 degrees. And because the droplet size is bigger, that is a greater angle than the 3D nozzle. And that's why we do it. The tip that makes the pattern, this is key. And it sounds obvious because in a nozzle, the tip has got to be important. But this is really important because it, it effectively means that our coefficient of variation, which is essentially droplet size distribution across the width of the fan is even fair and gives a nice even distribution of coverage as we've been campaigning for for years and we have got uh, we are ensuring that our coefficient of variation is nice even level from um, 35 centimeters up to 75 centimeters to give us uh, confidence that however you guys use it you will get the maximum level of efficacy and if we just give an example this is um, the levels of control we've had at uh, Barton in Cambridgeshire last year. Um, and I will, uh, we are assessing the other sites at the moment, but when, when I have those, I will share them with you. You can see the percent control up the Y axis and the nozzles we've used on the X axis. Um, and they range from different 90% drift reduction nozzles. So the ID3, uh, the TTI, IDTA, and the TTI twin, and obviously the 3D90, as well as a 75% drift reduction nozzle in there, the Amistar. And the 3D90 is pulling through as the highest level of efficacy out of that range of nozzles. So we believe we've de developed something that is quite unique insofar as it gives confidence in drift reduction, but also immense confidence in terms of efficacy as well. I am going to uh, wrap up there and thank you very much for your time. I think there's been a few questions. Um, Sally's been in charge of the questions. They have. Thank you, Georgie. Thank you, Harry, um, for those presentations. So first question that's come in, um, Harry, is for you. Uh, were there any trials carried out at intermediate water volume? So thinking more along the lines of 150 litres per hectare rather than the 100 or 200? Um, yes, we did. Uh, and I mean, I, I, I've got a graph to show it, but I didn't put it in this, but it, it um, it follows the curve essentially. So 150 was slightly better than 200. Um, 300 wasn't quite as good as 200, but probably similar to 400. So it, that's why we settled on 200 liters a hectare being our, our prime uh, application water volume. I think what's key to remember though, is output is important. It's better to get something on than not. And it's all about focusing on your problem field. So if you know how you have a field that is essentially a, a bad black grass or grass weed area, get the product on and aim it at 200 litres a hectare uh, and prioritise it. If you have fields that are less important, then maybe think about dropping back to 175, 150. And it's all about managing your farm as well as you know. Thank you. Um, just a last, uh, a last one before we wrap up today. Um, 
uh, it was a question about the 3D90 nozzle. Uh, what is the benefit of this over a 3D or a TTI nozzle, assuming the same water rate? Yeah, good question. Um, so in the trial work we've done, the 3D and TTI still perform very well. Um, I think for the three, the benefit over the 3D nozzle is we don't lose out on efficacy, but we don't compromise on drift reduction. So it gives us an element of uh, flexibility. Now I can't condone spraying in windy conditions, but as Georgie showed, I think the average gusts last year were over 16 miles an hour and the average wind speed was over four miles an hour. Now that is over what the Green Book advises good practice. So we know that's a challenge. So if we can minimize the effect that wind has on our nozzles, that's a benefit. So that's a benefit over the 3D without compromising efficacy. Over the TTI, which is still performing very well, and we don't, we're not gonna poo-poo that nozzle because it's looked after us very well over the last few years. Um, the benefit of the T over the TTI is it can be used in more circumstances. So in the work we've used it in, it can be used in um, uh, potato fungicides, for example, on potato blight, it can be used uh, on oilseed rate fungicides over and above the TTI and give better levels of efficacy. So overall, it's a more flexible nozzle. It also has a, a much nicer cap. I know that sounds silly, but it's a lot easier to put on the sprayer, which is integrated into the nozzle. Thank you. Um, Harry, sorry, can we just double check, please? A second ago, when we talked about the 150 litres per hectare um, option, I think you said that 150 no. was better than 200. Did you mean 150 was better than 100? Because you talked about the yeah, curve. 100, sorry, yeah, yeah, 150 better than 200. Oh, God, I'm giving us loads of model. <laughs> I've done this enough times. 100 and, 150 is better than 100. 200 is better than 250. Uh, 250 and 300 was, were flat compared to 200 and 400. So 200 is the optimum. If you go above that, we didn't see a massive benefit. If you go below that, you do get a drop off in efficacy. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, that's great. Um, in that case, um, I will uh, close today um, and just remind you all uh, that you can claim your basis and your OSO points um, with an email that will be sent out uh, after today. Um, there'll be a short survey and you'll be able to pop your details in there for basis and your OSO and then we can use those and pass them directly over to basis and your OSO for your points to be added to your accounts. Um, and uh, just once again, thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Thanks, everyone.